our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege you carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, a peace we often forfeit. Oh, a needless pain we bear. All because we do not. Despise, forsake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee, thou will find a solace there. Welcome to Northside Bible Chapel for Sunday, July 12th. This week we have Tom Bell speaking as well as next week. This week we have two birthdays. We have Owen Anderson on Tuesday and Debbie Christie on Saturday. Uh, we also have a Zoom prayer meeting uh, this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Uh, I believe that's all the announcements, so let's open in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day, and uh, thank you that we're able to meet online, uh, although not in person, and we can still have a message. And uh, I pray that the message will be uh, helpful and informative. I also pray for everyone who's affected by the pandemic in the world right now and that uh, you can help them and be with them and that they can see that they need you and in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, so are you weary? trouble the light in the darkness you see there's a light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there over us sin no more have dominion for more than conquerors we are turn your eyes upon Jesus 
Jesus Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace Good morning. As promised, we're going to be looking at uh, the letter to the Colossians this morning. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. We're going to be um, seeing a definite theme in this letter uh, that'll come out from uh, a very a well-known verse, Colossians 1.18, that says, And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And uh, what a wonderful thing to uh, meditate and to think on, uh, that our Lord Jesus would have the preeminence, that he would have uh, the first place, and we'll just get into a little bit. We're not even going to get to verse 18, I don't think, uh, today. But that's okay. Um, so what does that tell us? Uh, one thing it tells us is that uh, this whole thing, this church thing, this um, relationship with the Lord Jesus, it's not about you. And it's not about me. But it's all about Him. And so... Uh, why don't we look to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll uh, get into our passage this morning. Heavenly Father, once again, we just want to thank you for uh, the opportunity to look into your word and to, to think about it, to think about what it means for us in our lives. And so we just pray that you would use it to minister to our hearts today, uh, that we would take it to heart, that we would uh, allow it to change us, that we would allow it to change the way that we think and the way that we see the world. So we ask for your help, and we pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so Colossians chapter 1, let's just read a few verses here uh, from the beginning of this letter. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who was a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And we'll stop there. Uh, so let's just, let's just go through uh, these verses. Um, Verse 1, uh, Paul identifies himself, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, again, uh, he had not met these believers in Colossae. Uh, he had learned about what was happening with them and the things that uh, they were uh, being challenged with uh, through a pat by Epaphras. And so, um, again, he has to establish who he is and, and why they should uh, listen to what he's saying. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. He says it's by the will of God, uh, not uh, 
not sent by a specific church. I mean, uh, he was uh, sent out, he and Barnabas, by the saints in Antioch for the work which the Lord had called them to do. But um, he was sent out by the Lord Jesus himself. We see that in Acts chapter 9, that he had that encounter on the road to Damascus with the risen Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus had said that uh, Paul was chosen uh, to be a vessel, a chosen vessel, to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. So it's all, it's all by the will of God. Uh, there wasn't anyone who came to Paul and said, hey, you, you've, got a, you've got a talent for this. There's, uh, th this might be an avenue that you should pursue. No, this was uh, specifically something that the Lord Jesus uh, had for him to do and sent him to do as his apostle. He mentions Timothy here. And uh, even though we know that Paul looked at Timothy as a son in the faith, uh, we see there's, there's, no, um, there's no sense of hierarchy between the two of them. Uh, he just recognizes him as a brother. And Timothy, our brother. Uh, and then in verse 2, he, he says, It's to the saints and the faithful brethren, in Christ who are in Colossae. And uh, some of you I'm sure know, but um, if, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have been converted, if you've been born again, uh, then you are a saint. I know there's other groups that have uh, different definitions attached to that word saint, and they only bestow that uh, title on certain people, most of which who are no longer living, uh, like that's this special class of people. Uh, according to the Bible, it is a special class of people, but it's everyone who knows and loves the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. If you are a born-again believer, you are a saint. That's what the Bible says. Um, and he, he says again uh, here, um, the faithful brethren. And here that's not saying that um, uh, the saints are one group of people and faithful brethren are another group of people. The faithful brethren is just a modifier of that group of people, the saints, uh, that these are the people of faith, the, the faithful people in, uh, the, in Christ. He says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace was a common greeting, a common Greek greeting, and um, most of the people here uh, would have not been Jews, uh, so they probably would have uh, identified as Greek, although they were, um, they would have had. People, people from different areas, definitely people uh, with different uh, religions in that area. But a uh, common greeting was grace. And uh, peace is a common Jewish greeting. And so Paul says, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that um, it's the grace of God that extends salvation to all people. And it's once someone lays hold of salvation that they can have peace with God or that they do have peace with God. In verse 3, Paul says, We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Uh, it could also be translated that when they pray for them, they give thanks for them. And uh, Paul, he, ha he seems to have this attitude of thanksgiving. He says, we give, we give thanks to the God and, uh, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Um, and as a matter of fact, there's five other times in this letter that he mentions of giving thanks. What, what a wonderful attitude to have, that of giving thanks. 
And um, perhaps it's easy not to have that attitude. When we focus on the negative things, we focus on uh, the areas or the things that aren't going right, that uh, aren't unfolding the way that we think they should be, uh, we, can, we, we can become unthankful in our hearts. And, and there's some very serious warnings about being like that or having that way of thinking in the Word of God. Uh, we're warned against that. Do we, uh, do we rejoice when another believer is stirred in their spirit? or we see spiritual growth in others, does that cause us to rejoice? Or are we jealous? Do we wish that um, that was happening to us? No, that's not an attitude of thanksgiving or thankfulness. Uh, what about when we perhaps hear of another church and uh, there's a report of people, maybe many people, coming to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Uh, what is our first reaction? Are we, are we thankful? Uh, do, we, um, do we rejoice in that news? Or are we automatically skeptical? Do we um, call into question what happened without even knowing the facts? See, Paul here, he has uh, a thankful heart. Why? Um, in verse 4, he tells us, so since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. So there's a couple things here. Since they've heard, right, from Epaphras and just the testimony of what's taking place there in Colossae, he said, we, we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. So he heard the testimony. He heard of their faith in Christ Jesus. And he's giving thanks to God. He gave me thanks to God, not to the Colossians, right? Thank you for your wonderful testimony. Thank you for uh, how you've been living your lives and what you're believing and what's being said about. He doesn't thank them. He thanks God. It's a recognition that um, all of this is really a work of God, a work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. It's an important distinction there. Uh, if, we are, <laughs> if we are healthy spiritually, uh, it's nothing that we can uh, pat ourselves on the back for. It's nothing that we can say, well, you know, after years of, of hard work and meditation and years spent in the Word, uh, I have achieved this level of spiritual maturity. That's not it at all. Uh, I mean, these were... These were uh, relatively new believers. And it wasn't about them boasting in what they had achieved. It was about a work that God was doing in and among them. And so Paul's recognizing that. Um, and for us, uh, we need to recognize that it's God who is at work in, in everything that we do. Our growth, our service, our testimony, that it is a result of the work that He's doing in our hearts. We can lay no claim uh, to having made it happen. It's a work that He's doing. So he's thanking God for their faith in Christ Jesus and of their love for all the saints. This is also a consistent theme in the New Testament. Whether it's by exhortation or it's by uh, praise and encouragement as we see here. That's Paul's thanking God for their, the saints in Colossae, love for the saints. The Bible knows nothing of this idea that someone can love God but not love his people. Perhaps um, 
you have heard someone say something like that. They might say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm okay with God. It's just the Christians that I have a problem with. Now, maybe we can relate to that sentiment because uh, Christians are sinful people. We, we, we do things that are wrong. We sin against one another. We say things that are hurtful. So there might be a part of us that says, yeah, I, I kind of get that. But the Bible doesn't know anything about loving God and not loving His people. As a matter of fact, we have some very strong exhortations and statements about that very thing. In 1 John 4.20, it says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So there it is. You cannot love God and not love his people. Uh, they, you cannot separate the two. In 1 Peter 1.22, it says, Love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not out of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God. So the exhortation there, love one another fervently. That's... That's a pretty strong uh, modifying word for um, loving one another. Fervently, with a pure heart. Uh, Hebrews 13, 1. Let brotherly love continue. Uh, twice in 1 Thessalonians, we have the exhortation to love more and more, right? To abound more and more, to love more and more. And John 15, 12, uh, the Lord Jesus says, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So if we love God, we will love his people. I'm sorry. It, that's just that's what the word says. And the Colossians were doing this. No wonder Paul was giving thanks to God. And when he prays for them, uh, he gives thanks of their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love for the saints. Uh, for us to, to think that, uh, you know, they didn't have problems, uh, they didn't have personality conflicts, they didn't have disagreements about things is uh, perhaps naive uh, at best. And he's just wrong. Of course they dealt with those things. Of course uh, they had to, to work those things out in their own heart, but they had this testimony that they loved the saints. This is why um, I can't wait till we're able to meet together again. Right? I want to be with the Lord's people. So one day when that does happen, I, I'm just I'm so looking forward to it. If you love God, you will love His people. And verse five says, "Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel." The hope. Oftentimes, we, when we talk about our hope, uh, we differentiate between um, the kind of hope that we anticipate something that might happen and the difference in this hope. And um, it's true. Uh, the hope that we have is a certain hope. We know that it is going to happen. Uh, you could almost look at this uh, hope here as uh, the object or, or a noun, uh, that our, our hope is the Lord Jesus. Our hope is 
um, our home with Him, our eternity with Him, that this is a fixed hope. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. <laughs> our anticipation is, is of something that is laid up for us in heaven. It's fixed. It's certain. Of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. This word of truth, uh, the gospel message, it is from the living God. It is uh, the power of God for salvation. It's a, it's a living hope. Now, we know that there are those who would mock the Bible, uh, people who would scoff at the gospel message, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, thinking um, or accusing that it is a fairy tale, that it has been made up by men to control people. But uh, we know that the Word of God endures forever. People have attacked the veracity of the Word of God. They've tried to call into question uh, the, the historicity of the things that it speaks of historically, uh, but it has stood the test of time. And as it turns out, uh, there is great evidence for the truth of uh, the Word of God. And so we can trust it. We can know uh, that it is the Word of God, not just a book written by men, that it is God-breathed, that it is living, that it is powerful. And we see that in people's lives. We see how people's lives are transformed by the Word of truth, by the Word of God. Verse 6, he says, uh, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Um, the work of God in a believer's life produces fruit. It just does. Uh, it's God's grace that uh, has extended that offer of salvation uh, to anyone who would believe. It's something that no one deserves. And we can, we can bring nothing to it. That's, that's part of the gospel message, isn't it? Uh, that all have sinned. But it's worse than the bad things that we do. Uh, before someone believes on the Lord Jesus, uh, the Bible says uh, that we were, we were slaves to sin. Uh, even so much so in Isaiah 64, 6, uh, it says, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. So, before uh, someone is redeemed by the Lord Jesus, before they are born again, even the good things that we do, uh, the Lord views them as filthy rags. So, so we can bring nothing into this. It's all um, by the grace of God that He extends this offer of salvation, that He sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay for our sins, to be the ransom for many. Um, that this word that has come to the Colossians, that's come to us, it's gone out into the, all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, meaning that people are believing, people are, are passing out of death into life, and their lives are being changed. It will always produce fruit. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that you and I will always see that fruit. Uh, it, may, it may take a while to develop, but it's always there. And it's after someone has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and been redeemed by Him uh, that they can bear fruit unto righteousness. So again, it's, it's a work of God in our hearts and in our lives. 
verse 7, he says, As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. So they're reminded here that Epaphras has discipled them in the truth. He's been teaching them, uh, but he went back to Paul, perhaps because of uh, the issues that were taking place in and around them. Uh, and he's telling Paul and asking for help. But he also tells Paul of their love in the Spirit. And, and we see um, in, in Acts chapter 20, Paul gives a warning to the elders who were in Ephesus about this kind of thing. Uh, in 20, verse 28, it says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Now, Paul's going to set something straight, uh, especially by illuminating, illuminating who Christ is. Um, but people were, people were coming in and they were attempting to change the focus of the church in Colossae to other things. Um, we talked last week about the different ideas and thoughts that were taking place. Uh, the mysticism, uh, the Judaizers, the Gnostics, uh, were all trying to change the focus. And Paul's pointing them back to the simplicity that is in Christ. The Gnostics would say, yes, yes, it's Christ, but you need to be filled with, filled with a greater knowledge. And he's saying, uh, Christ is the fullness. You are complete in Him. It should be a big red flag when someone comes into a church <clears throat> and they try to woo people away, either uh, to another church or to another way of thinking that was happening in, in this church, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, or to try to woo people to themselves, to gain a following unto themselves, as Paul was saying uh, in Acts chapter 20. Um, I heard of this one particular church, and I'm not going to say where it was, somewhere in the world, and um, they were they were starting or planting a new church in this area. And what they did was they would find young Christians or young people and they were inviting them uh, out for meals and they would talk about spiritual things. They would talk about uh, this vision they had for this new work and they were, they were courting young families to come out from the churches that they were already in to help start this new work. Uh, they, they, they did not go to these other churches' leadership. They weren't having conversations with them saying, we want to start this new work. Would you pray for us? Would you consider sending people to help in this work? They didn't do any of that. They just went in, grabbed people, try to encourage them, try to uh, uh, give them a vision for what was happening in this new work. And essentially, they, they built their church gathering not by going out and preaching the gospel, not by asking other churches uh, to help with this church plant, but by stealing people away, wooing them to another work. I'm not going to talk about their, their doctrine or their teaching or, or their views on different things, but how they went about it should have been a, a huge waving red flag 
to the people uh, that they were trying to woo to help them plant this church. Verse 9, Paul says, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Yeah, verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Okay, so here he is again. He's praying for these believers. He's been told what's happening. What is he praying for? And to ask that you may be filled. There's that word again, filled, not with uh, some secret knowledge like the Gnostics, not with some uh, religious experience, perhaps like a mystic, but no, filled with the knowledge of His will, of God's will, and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Um, Paul keenly felt the need uh, to pray for the people of God. And, and, and there was an awareness of the opposition that these particular saints faced by the enemy. And I would suggest uh, that almost all saints face these kinds of oppositions, these kinds of uh, differing ideas, e even in today. Um, and he was, he was concerned for their growth their spiritual growth. It wasn't enough to know that uh, they were secure, they had a home in heaven, um, but he wanted them to continue to mature, to continue to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Um, back when I was working in construction, there was, um, there was a trade, my boss was a contractor, and uh, you tend to, have working relationships with different different contractors so you always if you can you use the same plumber you always use the same elect electrician and you build these working relationships and you know who you can trust and and how their work goes anyway um this one guy from another trade we we're having lunch one day and uh he it was a is a believer he's a christian uh, this may have been the first time we worked together and so he asked me Jesus. And I assured him that I did. And after he found out I was a believer, his interest in our conversation and me as, an, as a person just kind of <laughs> took a nosedive. I, I was almost offended. I was glad he was concerned about my soul, but that's all he was interested in. He didn't want to have a conversation. He didn't want to talk about any spiritual things past that. It was just done. And um, that's not the way Paul was, right? He, he was keenly interested in the growth of God's people. And he gave his, he gave his life to that, right? He, I mean, he, yes, he preached the gospel. He was planting churches, but he also went back. He was encouraging. He was writing letters to help them grow, to help them reach spiritual maturity. And so... He prays for them to be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So, maybe we can do that for ourselves. For Northside Bible Chapel, if you're watching and you, you gather at another church, uh, for your church, that we would make Christ first Right, that in all things He would have the preeminence, that we would make Him first, and that we would pray to be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And then when we, we have the knowledge of His will, that we would make that first as well. Right? Christ first and the work that He is doing. Let's make that first in our lives. Let's ask Him to show us what that is. It may be in line with, 
with what we think needs to happen, but it might be something different as well. And we need to be open to that. We need to be praying for that. Not that uh, He would bless what I want to do, but that He would reveal to us how He wants His work to move forward. And we would, we would be committed to that. So let's pray for one another. Let's pray uh, that we would make Him first and what He is doing first in our lives and in our church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you once again uh, for your word. We thank you for this letter to the Colossians, and we ask uh, that you would help us as we go through it uh, to understand it. And again, that you would speak to our hearts, uh, that we would make Christ first. He would be preeminent. And that the work uh, and, and his will for us would become evident, and we would make that first as well. So we ask for your help. And all of these things, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.